In the icy waters off the west coast of Greenland lies the wreck of one of the legendary ships of Arctic exploration. Join the sea hunters as they dive the remains of the Fox, the ship that finally discovered the fate of Sir John Franklin and his doomed expedition. In the spring of 1845, one Arctic challenge that remained unconquered was the Northwest Passage. No waterway had been discovered through the Americas to connect the Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific. Sailors heading west to the Pacific had to make the dangerous trek around South America's treacherous Cape Horn. Only the Arctic Ocean in the northern reaches of Britain's Canadian colonies offered the hope of a more direct route. The British Admiralty decided to send an expedition to complete the charting of the passage. This expedition would be the best equipped and most technically advanced voyage of discovery they had ever launched. Two sturdy warships built to take punishment were given several skins of extra oak planking and iron sheets to protect them from ice. The two ships, Erebus and Terror, were already heroes of discovery, having carried a British Antarctic expedition farther south than any human had ever been. They would be commanded by another hero of British exploration, Sir John Franklin, a 59-year-old officer who had already mapped hundreds of kilometers of Arctic shoreline during a famous expedition rife with suffering, starvation, murder, and cannibalism. His stolid integrity and extensive experience with the Arctic, combined with the best ships and supplies the Royal Navy could offer, filled Victorian England with the confidence that he would complete his mission with great success. He and his crew of 134 men departed London on May 19, 1845. After putting into Disco Harbour, Greenland, to load supplies, the Erebus and Terror sailed into Baffin Bay. There they exchanged greetings with two whaling ships who watched them sail into the fog of Lancaster Sound and into history. They were never heard from again. The Sea Hunters are a group of professional divers and underwater archaeologists. Their search for the remains of the shipwreck fox begins in Iqaluit, Canada. Flying from Vancouver, British Columbia, Halifax, Nova Scotia, and Port Dover, Ontario, Sea Hunters James Delgado, Mike Fletcher, and Warren Fletcher prepare for the next leg of the Arctic journey, a chartered flight over Baffin Bay to Greenland. The small plane, packed with film and dive gear, makes the potentially dangerous crossing in near-perfect weather and touches down in Asiat on Greenland's west coast. Traveling the short distance into town, the trio go down to the waterfront in search of a suitable ship to make the day-long voyage over frigid Arctic waters to their final destination, Kekertarsuak, on Disco Island. His name is uh, Yan West, Mr. West. Okay. And he's a shrimper, and he's from Disco Island. And with any luck, he can give us a lift over there. I think this is it here, Jim. Yeah. Nice big size. Right. Oh, yeah, this will work. Are you Mr. West? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm Mike Fletcher. I'm with the film crew. What? I'm with the film crew. You're from Disco Island? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Is it possible for us to pay for a ride to Disco? Oh, yeah. You Captain West gives the bergs a wide berth. He's well aware that the ice towering above his boat is but a fraction of the iceberg's total mass. Much more lies beneath the waves. Mr. West, is that uh, Disco Island over there? That's it? It's got the ice cap on the top? Yeah. With the day-long sail behind them, the Sea Hunters arrive in Kekertarsuak on Disco Island and the final resting place of the Fox. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And I like your hat. 
I like your hat. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. After saying their farewells to Mr. West and his crew, the sea hunters make their way to one of the world's oldest centers of Arctic study and science, the University of Copenhagen's Arctic Station. At the station, Mike meets with Benta Jessen Gray, the chief scientist of the facility. And what about tomorrow? What are you going to do? Well, I've heard that the weather is supposed to be quite poor tomorrow, yeah. stormy. But uh, we'll, we'll begin to get ready to start our diving, and I think we will dive tomorrow. Okay. Sea hunter archaeologist James Delgado meets with Carl Tobison, the local historian on Kekertarsuak. Have you guys figured out where the fox is? Well, there's a whole bunch of wrecks here. Carl says there's a wildfire, 1878. Is here. Okay, so that's right across there, and then Fox, 1912. Fox here. Mm. Years passed with no communication from Franklin, but the world did not forsake him. His disappearance became a British obsession. Between 1847 and 1859, 32 expeditions were sent in search of his whereabouts. In March, 1854, the Royal Navy finally decided to close the book on the expedition, declaring all hands lost. The expedition that had been proclaimed the best equipped, the most technically advanced voyage of discovery Britain had ever launched, had become the greatest disaster in the history of Arctic exploration. Resigned to never seeing her husband again, his widow was determined to at least learn how and where he had met his end. More than 11 years after Franklin had sailed from England, Lady Franklin purchased the 177-ton yacht Fox with some of the money raised from a public appeal. Under Lady Franklin's direction, the luxury yacht was given a stronger hull and larger steam boilers to turn it into a tough Arctic explorer. Outfitted with supplies donated by the British Navy, the Fox was prepared for one last search for the bones of Franklin. Sea Hunters divers, Mike and Warren Fletcher, move out to the spot identified by Carl as the location of the fox. Where did you see those pictures? The photos of the fox hauled up on the shore. Yeah, I think this is exactly the spot. Let's go on into the shore. Before coming to Greenland, Warren and I installed a new piece of diagnostic software onto his laptop. We took all of the information we could find about Fox in terms of photographs and drawings, anything that would let us show the Fox how it existed in, in the past when McClintock had it as a live working vessel. And the idea is that as we dive and as we learn more about the Fox today, as it exists on the seabed, we'll deconstruct that wireframe model and gather information that will last forever and be a permanent record of how the sea hunters found the fox on the bottom of this cove. Where can you set it up so that you more or less pull all the planking off the side of the hull? Well, uh, yeah, I can do that. Oh, yeah, that's got good. A diagram with just the ribs there. Yeah, look at that. Okay, but you got to orient it because you know the bow's pointing up in there, so we right. want it to. We, we want you to rotate it. Okay. Yeah, oh, there that. it goes. Okay, but as we learn more, we'll know whether to take this boiler out, whether to... Uh, yeah, we can jostle things around. And right, where the engine is. Yep. Where things have shifted around once we dive and get more information. Mm -hmm. As the team prepares to dive the Fox, the air is filled with the howls of community sled dogs who routinely sing at feeding time. On July 1, 1857, the Fox sailed from Aberdeen for Greenland. At Kerkatarsuak, he took on coal, sled dogs, and an Inuit hunter. But his first attempt to cross Baffin Bay was thwarted by the worst ice in years. Trapped in the ice flows, Fox proved her strength. 
the ship drifted for eight months with ice constantly grinding at her sides. Finally, in spring, the ice thawed, enabling the expedition to return to Greenland. After loading fuel and supplies once more, Fox set sail for Baffin Bay. At Beachy Island, he dodged ice until he arrived at the northwest shore of Boothia Peninsula, only to find a six-kilometer stretch of ice blocking his way. As the fox prepared for its second punishing Arctic winter lodged in the ice, McClintock organized an overland search of the area. The first trek lasted 26 days, during which time the average temperature was minus 33 degrees Celsius, with the coldest being minus 48 degrees. But the hardship paid off. From the local Inuit, they purchased artifacts of the Franklin expedition and heard tales of two sailing ships crushed and sunk by the ice near King William Island. Not only were they getting tantalizingly close to learning the fate of Franklin, but during this journey, McClintock mapped the final kilometers of North American coastline and became the first explorer to discover a Northwest Passage navigable by ships. When you're planning a dive, and an expedition and you realize that you're going into the Arctic to dive on a shipwreck, you imagine it's gonna be this very trying and difficult ordeal. But in reality, diving the Fox wasn't bad at all. In fact, because the water is shallow, our neoprene suits didn't collapse. So while we were prepared to spend hours shivering in the cold, in reality, we were really quite comfortable. I know that if we had to dive a lot deeper, then our suits would have compressed, and that would have meant that we would have lost all our insulation against the cold. And that would have been a whole different story. It was obvious that Fox had been a victim of the ravages of the North. Here's a shipwreck that's covered in ice probably five months of the year. And, and not just light ice, we're talking about ice that might freeze right to the bottom of this cove. Tons of force and friction. And as a result, the fox is split and crushed and pushed and splayed out across the bottom. When we first dropped into the water and swam over the wreck site of fox, I was stunned by how little there seemed to be. The boiler, the base of the engine, a couple of pieces sticking up out of the thick moss and weed that covered the seabed were all that I noted on that first dive. Though, as we swam over the wreck again and again, gradually through the murk and through the mess of green on the bottom, I began to discern shapes. I knew that we'd have to come back and continue work, this time mapping and measuring to archaeologically sort out what was on the bottom. And it would take archaeology to sort out just how much a fox had survived. Returning to the ever-trustworthy fox, still locked in the ice, McClintock organized a more extensive search. He and his men sledged south to Cape Victoria, at which point they split up into teams. McClintock crossed over and continued down the eastern coast of King William Island, headed for the Great Fish River area, while young Lieutenant George Hobson covered the northwest coast of the island. After searching near Great Fish River, McClintock made his way back north, this time up the western coast of King William Island. Hobson, meanwhile, discovered cairns surrounded by piles of ship stores and personal possessions. Within the cairn, he found notes written on Royal Navy forms, indicating that the Franklin ships would have been trapped in the nearby ice through the winter of 1846 and 1847. This suggested that the expedition had only been 144 kilometers from discovering the final stretch of a Northwest Passage. Whether they succeeded in sledging to that point, no one will ever know. Reading on, 
Hobson learned that Sir John Franklin was dead. Sadly, he had perished in 1847, one of 24 men who had died at the time of the writing. The survivors, having been trapped in the ice for 18 months, gave up hope of ever escaping. They decided to abandon the ships and attempted an impossible 1,400 kilometer trek inland. Hobson, suffering the onset of scurvy, collected the notes, the only written records ever found of the Franklin expedition, and began the torturous journey back to the Fox. On the way, the teams made a grisly discovery, a ship's boat resting on a heavy sledge containing two skeletons. One, warmly dressed in naval attire, surrounded by a collection of watches, shotguns, silverware, and other paraphernalia, and his shipmate, whose bones showed signs of having been devoured by something, or someone. After the team's initial dive on Fox, Jim returns to the museum to discuss some of the reasons for Franklin's tragic failure. Greenlanders and all the Inuit, they have clothing that's designed to work in the north. Mm. But then the European explorers come, like the English, and they want to wear their leather boots and their wool clothing, and they were freezing and dying. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, why? Well, that was their, their clothes, and they were used to them. I think they, they have been thinking something like that. It was primitive clothing. They didn't really want to wear it. Uh, they didn't know how much better it was than the European clothes they, they wore. Yeah. You could be a well-dressed English officer and die, or dress primitive and live. Yes. Well, it's maybe the same with the food. Uh, the Inuits ate uh, the animals they hunted here, and they ate uh, very much fat. But the European people coming here, they ate a lot of salted pork, and they got uh, scurvy. Oh, yes, scurvy, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, they, they did. Uh, but uh, beside them lived the Inuit, and they didn't get scurvy. So for an explorer to be successful up here, you have to adapt, like the Inuit did, wearing this type of clothing. Yes eating the, the food off the land, the raw food in many cases, none of which any of these English explorers did. No. So. so they died, many of them. McClintock had solved the mystery of the Franklin expedition and had discovered a navigable Northwest Passage. After 76 days of sledging, covering more than 1,400 kilometers, he and his team returned to the security of the Fox. On August 10, 1859, the tough little ship began the journey home. In London, the explorers were greeted with tremendous acclaim. McClintock was knighted for his achievement, and Hobson was promoted. Throughout the rest of his naval career, Hobson never again volunteered for Arctic service. Lady Franklin, her mind at rest at last, would witness the construction of a monument to her husband's work. Sir Francis McClintock's recounting of his adventures went on to become a Victorian best-selling novel. As for the Fox, the tough little steam schooner that had carried McClintock and his crew into the ice-packed ocean and back again, she would soon return to the Arctic. She was chartered by the Atlantic Telegraph Company to survey an inner island route for an Atlantic cable. In 1864, the ship was sold to a Danish mining operation and spent the rest of her days sailing in the waters off Greenland. She became well known as a remarkably safe and sturdy ship. At last, in 1912, she ran aground near Attu, Greenland. Fox was refloated, but it was determined that more than 50 years of Arctic wear and tear had finally taken a toll on the old hull and she was removed from service. The hulk was towed to this cove and abandoned, becoming part of the landscape for many years after. At some point, she slid from her resting place into deeper water.
The next morning, the team gears up for a second dive on Fox. Based on the first inspection of the wreck, Jim has planned specific areas the team will target. All right. So have you got a plan, Jim? Yeah, Mike, I think basically at this stage of the game, what we want to do is really get these features, get their dimensions drawn, get those recorded, and then we'll lay the baseline, and then and only then will we start tying things in on the baseline. Everything we learn on the bottom is going to add to the wreck. Hauled into the small cove at the edge of the harbor, Fox was left to the elements. Lying on her starboard or right side, the, the ship's port side was exposed to the ice that formed each year. A storm in 1940 finally doomed the hulk. Firmly pressed into the seabed, the, the flattened starboard hull of Fox survives from keel to the edge of the deck. But the once three-dimensional form of the dauntless steamer has become thanks to decades of ice pressure, a two-dimensional landscape of ship's architecture and fittings. No one's ever surveyed this boat, have they? No, nobody's surveyed or done any kind of reconnaissance on this wreck. In fact, this is only gonna be the second time ever in the Arctic where somebody's dived, mapped, archeologically documented shipwreck ever. Really? Oh yeah, the logistics of getting to a place like this, let alone diving, let alone doing archaeology. It was amazing to go down into that beautiful clear water and find the fox just resting there. Here was this famous ship, one of the most famous ships in Arctic exploration, right here. And even though we were only perhaps five or six kilometers from the Arctic station, I still felt the sense of being in a distant and remote place. On the second dive to the wreck of Fox, as we began to push the weed away, here and there where it just lay loose on the bottom, as we carefully mapped the seabed, what unfolded was a sense of Fox two-dimensionally, not three-dimensionally, on the seabed. Fox had been pressed flat right into the bottom by the mass of ice that covers the wreck each year. As you swim over the wreck of Fox, what you're struck by is large features, which for the most part correspond to exactly where they would have been in the hull. From the massive timbers in the frame at the stern, where the propeller was once mounted, to the large boiler pulled free of its position and now located behind the engine. Moving forward, the bow area of the ship, largely marked by the huge timbers that form the framing of that part of the hull. That, and only that, is left on the seabed, leaving other pieces up on the shore. All of these things, as well as the thick timbers of the body of the ship, certainly revealed to me the secret to Fox's survival in Arctic seas, and the reason why more than 90 years after the vessel had finally been abandoned, even on the bottom, flat, Archaeology is at its best and its most powerful when it links us to real people and their stories. And diving and looking at the remains of Fox was my opportunity with the rest of the team to do just that. History is more than just events, and it's more than just names. It's very personal at times. In the 1980s, when archaeologist Owen Beatty exhumed three of the graves of Franklin's men, we were able to gaze directly into the faces and into the eyes of John Torrington, John Hartnell, and William Brain. These three, removed from their icy graves on Beachy Island, had been the first to die. And yet, thanks to the harsh environment that killed them, they looked just as they had at the moment of their death. And to this day, anyone who views those photographs cannot forget that this was not a dry, dusty historical footnote. This was a story of people fighting for survival. The Northwest Passage, and in fact, there are actually several potential passages through the Arctic archipelago, depending on the advance and retreat of the ice, was finally opened through the sacrifice of lives, ships, and a great deal of money. And yet, despite this tremendous cost, the Northwest Passage has never served as a viable international waterway for commerce and trade. 
These days, the Northwest Passage is often the domain of tourists aboard ice-breaking cruise ships and modern adventurers challenging the Arctic's extremes. But some say that global warming would create changes in the North. Potentially, ice that had blocked channels for centuries could retreat during the summer months. If the pack ice melts away, perhaps the early explorer's dream of a practical, navigable passage connecting the hemispheres may be realized. That story is as yet unwritten, but if a viable Northwest Passage becomes a reality, it will owe much to John Franklin and Francis Leopold McClintock. Both risked everything in the cause of exploration and discovery, but only one survived to share his adventures with the world his success was due in part to the rugged little ship, Fox.